This week, black gold transformed the Middle East into a global hub for business, finance, and trade. So how do you wean the world's biggest oil producers off crude? As long as the world needs hydrocarbons, we will be supplying hydrocarbons. Um, we can't just uh, switch off the tap. This is an energy transition. The UAE and Saudi Arabia recently became the first Gulf nations to announce net zero goals. We explore some of the ways they're aiming to hit their emissions targets. You have this kind of cycle, more green, more oil and gas. Unless you have greater economic diversification, we're going to see this dependence on oil revenues continuing. Plus, oil built the Middle East, but it might be another fuel that propels it into the future. Could the Gulf's next boom be driven by gas? Renewable is something uh, that, that will definitely happen. We are doing a lot of renewable ourselves. But I think you need gas uh, to complement that. I'm Yusuf Gamal Dean, and this is Bloomberg Green. We're here at ADIPEC, one of the biggest conferences on the commodity that made the Middle East rich oil. But in a changing climate, the buzz around oil isn't what it used to be. Fossil fuels are driving humanity towards a warming planet, and the Middle East is one of the most vulnerable regions to the threat of climate change. Despite this, net zero targets were only announced this year. So why has it been so slow to embrace cutting carbon? Droughts, heat waves, floods, and fires. The often hot and harsh climate of the Middle East is only getting worse. Aid groups warn that 12 million people are at risk of losing access to water in Iraq and Syria. Syria is suffering from its worst drought in 70 years. The effects of conflict and COVID-19 are compounding the growing humanitarian crisis. In Egypt, hotter, drier temperatures, coupled with a growing population, are slowly draining the Nile River. In the Gulf, more than a dozen people were killed when the surprisingly powerful cyclone Shaheen rammed into Oman and Iran this October. The storm originally hit India, but was re-energized by warm water temperatures in the Arabian Sea. Temperatures there are only likely to rise. And coastal cities along the Gulf that are already oppressively hot and humid in the summer, like Doha, Dubai, and Saudi Arabia's Dammam, face increasingly frequent summer heat waves that could make staying outside for more than a short period dangerous. But despite a foreboding list of climate threats, no region is more threatened by the shift away from oil and natural gas towards cleaner energy sources. In less than 100 years, Gulf rulers have taken their countries from sleepy villages to glittering metropolises on the back of their massive reserves of oil and gas. Now they're under pressure to leave the hydrocarbons behind. Some are making ambitious green promises. In October, the UAE pledged to get to net zero by 2050, while Saudi Arabia and Bahrain said they'd achieve that milestone by 2060. But these plans are built on uncertain ground. They don't address oil and gas these countries ship to consumers around the globe. And scientists are dubious about whether carbon capture, trapping carbon dioxide before it can escape into the atmosphere, will ever be successful enough to reverse the emissions of burning fossil fuels. If the world no longer needs their fuel, it's unclear what would drive these still heavily hydrocarbon-dependent Gulf economies. For all their green pledges, the Gulf's energy ministers say the global gas crunch and a spike in oil prices are proof the world still needs them and still needs investment in their oil and gas, perhaps for decades to come. So despite or Perhaps because of oil's permanence in the region, the Middle East has been a relative latecomer to net zero ambitions. But on the eve of COP26, Saudi Arabia, the region's biggest economy, announced that it would go carbon neutral by 2060. With the starting pistol fired, how does an economy dependent on oil go green? We're not seeking funding. We're not seeking, seeking finance. We're not seeking uh, grants. We're seeking, or we're, our approach depends on uh, congregating with those who, who are willing yeah. and have the wherewithal mm -hmm. to join in creating technologies and developing and yeah. deploying technology. I mean, if I may flesh that out in a bit more detail, I mean, is this event, what we're seeing here from the Sony Green Initiative, an opportunity to build consensus 
on the Saudi view on this issue ahead of COP26. It's an embarkation point because as I was laying our own proposals, uh, this event is not going to be an event for the purpose uh, of, you know, a PR stunt or what have you. Uh, this event is, is part of a, of a foundation that the Crown Prince, Prince, Crown Prince Mohammed has put together. This event will be carried every year. Uh, and if we can get enough partners to reach out, this is what we have discussed today, is what we will so, will do as Saudi Arabia proper. And we hope uh, that there are so many countries that will be, become a part of that. If that happens, and we wish it happens, yeah. then we will have very much meaningful things to do. You know, I did say right. we did not create all of the above, but to make sure that we stand to be accountable to what we are initiating, and we will continue uh, being uh, uh, reviewing what, what all of these initiatives on these yearly meetings. Not to be outdone, the United Arab Emirates has its own plans for carbon neutrality. They are hoping to reach that by 2050. The country was the first in the region to declare a net zero ambition, but has been an investor in green energy for at least 15 years over which time it has spent roughly $40 billion on alternative power. We spoke to the UAE Climate Minister, Maryam El Mehiri, about her country's plans. It was a historic move for us, uh, and uh, net zero by 2050 for us is an, uh, and actually it's an, a natural step. It's a historic move, but a natural step. Why? Because we've actually been down this path for the last 15 years. So it didn't just start with this initiative uh, 15 years ago. So the clean energy mix, solar, nuclear, uh, we are um, uh, on track to reach 14 gigawatts uh, by 2030 from just above 100 megawatts where we started in 2015 and 2.4 mm -hmm. gigawatts in 2020. Uh, as I said, the, uh, uh, we also want to reduce uh, energy consumption uh, by 40% for the year of 2050. So these are sort of the overarching um, uh, targets that we are trying to reach. I really want to get your view uh, in terms of, of, of what else. How do you square net zero with your production? But first of all, will nuclear be the bigger part of the transition, do you think? So nuclear won't be the bigger part. Clean energy will be the bigger part. So about 44% will be clean energy, 6% will be nuclear. Um, so mm -hmm. that's so that you have the, the percentages uh, there. So that's how the components are going to be broken down okay. uh, by 2050. You mentioned the figure of $40 billion uh, is what you've spent so far uh, as a nation state on this transition. What is what is the projection on what you're going to need to spend? So we have uh, 160 billion dollars is what we're planning to invest uh, in the next three decades uh, in clean and renewable energy. Um, also, not forgetting that it's not just that we're also looking at nature-based solutions as well. Um, uh, as you know, we have a lot of mangroves here in the UAE. Um, mangroves are actually four times more effective in, in carbon uh, sequestration than, uh, than uh, um, forests. So we're going to be stepping up um, and uh, planting much more grand mangroves. Just before we go, I suppose the, the biggest conundrum, it's the global issue, which is countries such as the UAE and Saudi Arabia announced net zero, but yet continue to be major exporters of oil, of fossil fuels, through to 2050. How do you square that away? So, Manas, as long as the world needs hydrocarbons, we will be supplying hydrocarbons. Um, we can't just uh, switch off the tap. This is an energy transition. Transition means that every country also has its limitation. Every country has to define um, what it's able to do right now and where it needs a bit more investments, etc. So what we can say here is that as long as the world needs hydrocarbons, we will supply hydrocarbons. But it's important that hydrocarbons that are supplied are as low carbon intensive as possible. And we do have a very competitive advantage here in the UAE that we are 
amongst the lowest carbon intensive providers when it comes to hydrocarbons. Coming up, a region never short of ambition. We take a look at some of the large scale solutions Gulf nations have to hit their emissions targets. All that is next. This is Bloomer Green. Right here in London and this is everything you need to know in green this week. The European Union is targeting a plan to remove 5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere annually by 2030. Bloomberg understands the bloc wants carbon removal to play a part in meeting its goal of carbon neutrality by mid-century. EU total CO2 emissions are some 3.5 billion tonnes a year. China will need a year-end installation rush if it's to meet its solar targets for 2020 the world's biggest solar market added around 29 gigawatts of capacity in the first 10 months of the year, well short of the forecast for 55 to 65 gigawatts set by the country's industry association. The slow growth comes after cost inflation hit the solar supply chain, with solar panels rising in price for the first time in eight years. Europe is growing increasingly reliant on coal to keep the lights on as the weather turns cold, sending the cost of the polluting material to a record. Carbon prices exceeded 70 euros a tonne for the first time this week as utilities turn to the dirtiest of fossil fuels. The region is facing an energy crisis as demand jumps while supplies remain limited. And that's your green brief, Yusuf. Neon, a futuristic zero carbon city being constructed in northwestern Saudi Arabia, is a $500 billion experiment in net zero design. If it works, it effects are going to be felt across the world. This patch of land in northwest Saudi Arabia is going to become Neom, a city powered entirely by renewable energy. The government hopes the site, which is the size of Belgium, will be a clean energy hub, not only for the kingdom, but also the world. This here is at the borderline between Mission Impossible and Suicide Mission. Lucky enough, so far, we've just been on the right side of the line, yeah? But, you know, it's, it's, it's very close to that. You know, this is just smoking. This is nothing ever, ever I've seen or heard of, of the dimension, the challenge, you know? I'm not talking energy only, you know, but, but in, its, in its broadest context, context including the geopolitical dimension, uh, including the cultural dimension. NEON will include a $5 billion hydrogen plant run on wind and solar energy. All of the zero carbon fuel it produces will be shipped to international buyers in the form of ammonia. When it starts operating in four years time, it will be one of the biggest hydrogen facilities in the world. I can't explain NEON on the back of a set of PowerPoints and a video clip. You just need to be here, you need to you know, breathe it in. Specifically, the startup mode and you know things happening. The bus is all around you here. I spoke to Niam's CEO Nadmi and Nasser about the ambitious plan. Today, if you go to Niam, you will see construction all over. You will see earthwork going all over. You will see uh, regions that are being developed mm -hmm. either to be resorts, either to be residential accommodation and or hotels. Yeah. That's all happening as we speak. How much progress have you made with the line if you had to put it in percentage terms? Are you at 5%, are you at 15%? And, well, I cannot put it in a progress report because first the line represents 90% of the full NEOM project, 9-0. We've started the all the infrastructural work for the line because there is two pieces of the line, the spine, which is the whole mobility system, which is all underground. We started working on that, and the line is the cities above ground. We are now busy doing earthwork, moving sands, moving mountains, yeah. moving a lot. When do you think we'll see people start living uh, in certain areas of the line, for example? I would say early 24. We will have accommodations built for good number and uh, hospitality, hotels, so we can attract 
uh, tourists mm -hmm. and of course airport so we can have our airport where people yeah. can live all of this uh, first quarter of 24 okay. will be the first milestone we want to meet the region has a lot of ambitious plans and a history of successful engineering on a grand scale but are they doable and enough to meet the Middle East's climate goals? I spoke with Carol Mechle, the CEO of Crystal Energy at the Aripec Oil and Gas Conference in Abu Dhabi, about the energy transition in the fossil fuel capital of the world. I mean, you would expect to have people talking about the energy transition, of course, not going to dissipate from discussions today, especially that we just finished with COP26. But I attended ADIPEC two years ago, and I had the impression that back then, discussions about the energy transition were much more pronounced than what you see today. Today, there is another important aspect that's being discussed at the conference, that is energy prices, high fossil fuel prices, whether natural gas or oil or even coal, even carbon prices. So you find it acquiring a new dimension than what was, let's say, two years ago, even last year when they had it virtually. Yes. So energy transition is there we're not going to forget about it on the contrary we hear lots of new commitments dedication clean investment but I have the impression that also concerns about investment in conventional fuel particularly oil and gas is also capturing great attention and being used as a reason why we are seeing the prices that we are seeing today the UAE is going to host COP28 and you think that that would be enough to sort of stimulate the new wave of of investments and attention. Is that going to be enough, do you think? Nothing is going to be enough, to be honest. I mean, definitely it will be a stronger catalyst because we should be uh, fair about the region. They are already undertaking investment in green energy, right? They have, you have nuclear in the UAE. They are quite conscious about increasing the share of renewable energy in the region. You have IRENA here. Definitely there will be greater interest and you might hear more ambitious and bolder gold, but by itself it's not going to be enough, neither for the region nor for the rest of the world. The Middle East wants to go more and more green, that's for sure. Historically, when oil prices are higher, there was a tendency to spend more, especially in countries like Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to move away from that now, to try and create a more sustainable fiscal program. Does that put some of the green initiatives at risk, do you think, because they're not using that windfall to help with the transition? Absolutely. When it comes to the energy transition here, you need more investment. And the problem, I think, in the region is not the lack of capital, lack of will. It's more the lack of economic diversification, which means that the more you want to invest in green energy, and they require a lot of money, a lot of capital, then you need to have more oil and gas revenue. So you have this kind of cycle, more green, more oil and gas. Unless you have greater economic diversification, we're going to see this dependence on oil revenues continuing. So that's where I see here, the, the thing that can make a huge difference for the region going forward is economic diversification, which is going to have positive spillover on energy diversification. Coming up, oil built the Middle East, but it might be another fuel that propels it into the future. Will natural gas be enough to wean the Gulf off oil? Explore that next. This is Bloomberg Green. Natural gas is the world's favorite transition fuel. It emits less carbon than oil and half as much as coal. Fortunately for the Middle East, 40% of the world's proven gas reserves lie just below the surface. Will the Gulf's next boom be driven by gas? Our own Simone Foxman has a story. As global leaders pledge to cut carbon emissions, there's only one fossil fuel that may still be on the rise. Natural gas. Renewable is something uh, that, that will definitely happen. We're doing a lot of renewable ourselves. But I think you need gas uh, to complement that. Suppliers like Qatar argue that natural gas, when produced as cleanly as possible, is key to the energy transition. The Gas Exporting Countries Forum, or GECF, which has been compared to OPEC for gas, expects demand to overtake coal in 2025 and says natural gas will be the largest global primary energy source by 2047. Other energy organizations beg to differ. 
The International Energy Agency said development of new gas fields, in addition to oil and coal, should end immediately to keep open the possibility of net zero emissions by 2050. So does the world need natural gas? And if so, for how long? And that's an existential question here in Qatar, the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. That's natural gas that's been cooled and condensed to be transported around the world more easily. Qatar's investing billions of dollars to try and expand its production capacity of LNG by some 60 percent over the next six years. Its key market is emerging economies, places where heating and electricity demand is growing rapidly because governments in Asia and Africa just aren't sure that development of renewables like solar and wind will be able to keep up. Look at where we are today, I mean, in terms of uh, energy generation, I mean, in terms of uh, energy uh, uh, distribution in, in, our, in our countries. Uh, a large number of uh, our people are still without energy. I think you can't jump from one to the other. I think you have to find an intermediary. And it seems like natural gas is going to be that intermediary. Natural gas burns greener than coal, emitting 50 to 60 percent less carbon dioxide. It's also more efficient than oil. And that's why natural gas producers say it's key to helping emerging economies wean off less clean energy sources. But the reality is a bit more complex. I think out of all the major fossil fuels, you know, gas is probably the one that's most uncertain. You could see a very bright future for gas, or, or you can see projections where gas, gas use reaches a peak quite soon and then goes into a decline. Take Asia specifically, where the GECF says demand for natural gas is expected to double by 2050. A uh, typical trend in Asia Pacific and almost all markets is that gas is about twice as expensive as uh, utility solar. It's about twice as expensive as onshore wind. Governments, as they have been for many years, are doing everything they can to keep the share of gas low. The region underpins gas exporters' long-term outlooks. They believe Asia Pacific will account for more than 42 percent of the increase in global gas demand over the next 30 years. Gas is uh, one of the most expensive forms of power, but it's also one of the most flexible, which means that in the case where your demand is higher than you think or than you, than you planned it would be, um, you can ramp up the share of gas. That's important because the battery technology that can efficiently store solar power to use when it's not sunny or wind power when there's no breeze still has a long way to go. You really can't put a, a price on reliability because as soon as you have a blackout, the, the dollar values go out the window and people are very willing to pay for very expensive gas power uh, when the lights go out. We expect that to take five or ten years before uh, batteries can really uh, start to play a much bigger role in the grid. Batteries aren't the only wild card. Mideast producers in particular are pouring money into technology around carbon capture and storage, hoping it will one day allow them to pump oil and gas without adding carbon to the atmosphere. But the technology behind this and behind getting it to work at scale is still uncertain. There's a bit of a window of opportunity now for countries to capture that gas market. And you know, if they don't capture it now, then, then it may be gone. I think you can see Qatar's gas uh, expansion of its gas exports in that light. They're trying to capture a market when it's uh, when it's available, also trying to keep out other potential competitors. For now, Qatar energy executives are busy tying up deals with the likes of Pakistan, China and Korea to supply them with LNG for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But after that, the future of LNG and natural gas may be anyone's guess. In Doha, I'm Simone Foxman, Bloomberg Green. That's it for this week's edition, but keep the conversation going. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter at Climate. I'm Yusuf Gamelidin in Dubai, and this is Bloomberg Green.